Friends, please be seated. You know, this Sunday in the lectionary, in the cycle, the three-year cycle that we have, is always my favorite um, reading of Advent. Not only because it deals with angels and the angel Gabriel being um, a pretty important angel, the messenger of God, but also because it's all about Mary's yes. It's all about Mary's let it be, right? It's all about Mary's not just her acquiescence or her the overshadowing of the power of the Holy Spirit, but her willingness, in spite of it all, to be the servant of God. And so for this reason, you know, I think that I call Mary the first apostle, the first disciple of Jesus. Disciple, as we recently discovered in the Rector's Bible study, is one who follows um, a teacher, but an apostle is one who takes the teaching out into the world. And literally, Mary takes the word of God and bears it for the world. She is the Theotokos, they call it in the Greek Orthodox tradition, where in Greek it means God-bearer. And so she bears that as, as the first apostle. And her radical faith and trust in God more than qualifies her for the task at hand. But the truth is also that there is so much more going on in this story than Mary. The story is far less about Mary than it is about God. When the angel Gabriel announces his good news for Mary and the world, we must remember his parting words to the confounded Mary. Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible. Now, we've lived long enough, some of us, to know when the impossible has become the possible. Right? Can I get an amen from the people with white hair in the crowd? You know that. You can look back on your lives and say, oh, there was a moment when the impossible became possible. When I pulled through the illness. When I was able to find a sponsor in the middle of the night. When I was able to love again after having my heart broken. These words spoken by Mary, or spoken to Mary, not only sum up the birth stories of both John the Baptist and of Jesus, but also they remind the reader and the hearer of other occasions of impossibility or improbability in, into which God intervened. With the barren Abraham and Sarah, with Hannah, with Zechariah and Elizabeth. But each of those situations, I will remind us, was only improbable because of their age. And in their circumstances, no one would expect a child at all. But the birth Gabriel is announcing to Mary is not only improbable, it is impossible. Should we lean in to this Christmas story and accept that Mary is a virgin. I don't have to explain why that makes it impossible. This crowd also understands that. That is beyond anyone's comprehension. And most of all, Mary's, whose response to the heavenly messenger with fiery eyes downcast was something along the lines of, I paraphrase, say what? But how can this be? I am a virgin. And the angel responds in much the same way the angel responded to the incredulous Abraham and the laughing Sarah in Genesis chapter 18. Is anything too difficult or too wonderful for God? It is a reminder that the God we worship, the God about to be revealed in the child soon to be born by Mary, is the God of mystery and wonder beyond anything you and I might conceive. Like, for example, the mysterious and wonderful notion that God might stoop to become human 
in a cosmic act of love and grace. The God of the impossible is also the God of grace. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to turn this microphone off because somebody's got a cell phone on and it's just interfering with that frequency. And it just annoys me enough. How about you? No, okay. Let us recall the working definition of grace. Grace is God doing for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. This grace is about God entering our human lives and doing for us that which we find impossible. Now bring those things to mind, those moments in your life when you have understood that what needed to happen was impossible, that what needed to happen would defy the laws of physics or gravity or history or memory. In this case, it is Gabriel's greeting to Mary which reveals its graceful nature. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. Now, the word translated here for favor as favored one is the same word for grace. Grace. The word is charis in Greek. It is the same root as our word charisma, and it is the same root of the word for our tangible daily reminder of God's grace in our lives in the Holy Eucharist, the gift of God, doing for the people of God that which they cannot do for themselves. Therefore, Greetings, favored one, can equally be translated, greetings, graced one. Mary is being caught up in the drama of God's grace, caught up in the unmerited, undeserved favor of the same God who favored, who carised so many before her and continues to carise so many after her because of what God has done in and through her. Now please note, there is not one word here about her virtue. There is not one mention of Mary's worthiness, her suitability or predisposition for motherhood, or even her faithfulness. Not one word that would explain to us why God should choose her. Only the word that God did choose her. Out of God's mysterious and wonderful grace, favor, God chooses Mary. Mary isn't favored because she merits the favor or because of who she is or what she's done. She's favored simply because God chose her. An ordinary person with no pedigree, no family name or high station. She was chosen above all to deliver the one who would deliver the world and was therefore the recipient of God's favor or charis, God's grace. Indeed, highly favored by God and by all. Like Mary, the mother of life, we are all chosen to bear God in and for the world. We are all called to be God-bearers, theotokai, if you will. But not only to bear Christ for the world, but to respond to the favor and blessing which God has shown us in choosing us. God chooses you Mary is chosen, and her response to such grace is first the acknowledgement, and this is often skimmed over and forgotten. Mary's first response is an acknowledgement. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. 
in her response, she acknowledges that this is not a voluntary relationship dependent upon her cooperation or her choice. God has spoken. This isn't going to committee. This is happening right now. This is what it means to be the object of God's grace and blessing and favor. It convicts us. God's grace descends upon us, it captures us, it convicts us, and it binds us to its own purposes, such that we cannot continue to live as we had before. If you do live as you had before, it is not God that you encounter, it is yourself. We are forever changed in our encounter with God. Forever transformed by the choosing, convicting, favoring, transforming, gracing of God. Luke will later tell a story about another upon whom the grace of God descended, blinding him, convicting him, transforming him, such that in today's letter to the Romans, Paul describes his response as the obedience of faith. Paul, the second Super apostle echoes Mary, the first super apostle's response to God's favor. Here I am, he says, the servant of the Lord. Your word is spoken, let it be. And this is the final word on all this Advent stuff. It is about God's word. The word of God spoken at the beginning through whom all things came into being. The word spoken over Mary to begin a new creation in her. It is that same word that is spoken to you and to me, the same word that we speak in worship, the same word we invoke when we bless and we sanctify. It is the same word we call upon in our hours of darkness, in our times of trouble. The word will be the answer. Let it be. It's not about Mary, just it is is not really about you or me. And yet, it's all about you and me. (laughs) And thanks be to God for that. This story is about God, for whom nothing is is impossible. God, who is first and foremost a God of love and grace, a God who chooses ordinary human beings of all stations and circumstances to become servants for and to God's own purposes. In this story, her name just happens to be Miriam. It just happens to be Mary, but hers is not the only story being told here. By God's grace and invitation, it is your story. It is my story. God chooses each of us, favored each of us, graced each of us by the power of God's Spirit. God descends upon us and conceives Christ in us. Like Mary, you and I are called to be God-bearers. And the promise remains the same. No matter the hardships, the impossibilities that this life may bring, nothing is impossible with God.